let's check the latest news updates with Aparna Watts. Namaskar. Welcome to Friends World TV. I'm Aparna Watts and here's the news. Well, actually, we can sum up the news in just one word. We can just say coronavirus and that will be the start and end of the news. But uh, here's the news. Countries welcome PM's move to seek meat. Pandemic declared virus survival studied. Americans brace for new life of no school and growing dread. Russian lawmakers move to keep Putin in power past 2024. Who will keep the lights on if coronavirus continues to spread? It's a question the government is grappling with. Japan still preparing for Olympics, Prime Minister says, as virus concerns rise. The news in detail. SARC leaders are set to hold a summit via video conference on coronavirus on Sunday at 5 p.m. After Pakistan late Friday night accepted Prime Minister Narendra Modi's proposal for such a meeting. Islamabad, however, specified that the engagement would be at the level of the special assistant to the Pakistan PM on health. In a tweet, Pakistan Foreign Office spokesperson Aisha Farooqi said, we have communicated that special assistant to Pakistani Prime Minister on health Zafar Mirza will be available to, to, to participate in the video conference of SARC member countries on the issue. Two more positive cases were reported across the country on Saturday, taking the official number to 84, including two deaths. The new cases were reported from Jaipur and Hyderabad. Uttar Pradesh Surveillance Officer Surveillance Vikasendu Agarwal said a woman who returned from Canada on March 8 had also tested positive. Reports of some more positive cases in Maharashtra have not been confirmed by the Health Ministry. The Union Home Ministry Saturday announced classification of coronavirus as a notified disaster. For the purpose of providing assistance under the State Disaster Response Fund, PM Modi would lead India at the SARC video conference. In a tweet Saturday night, he said, timely action for a healthier planet. Tomorrow at 5 p.m., leaders of SARC nations will discuss via conferencing a roadmap to fight the challenge of COVID-19 novel coronavirus. I'm confident that our coming together will lead to effective outcomes and benefit our citizens. With SARC almost defunct as India took a hard position on Pakistan's role in terrorism, Modi's offer on Friday took the neighboring countries by surprise. While the number of coronavirus cases is relatively less in South Asia, the density of the population, the absence of robust public health infrastructure and lack of public hygiene are seen as challenges and would come up at the video conference. After India, Pakistan has the highest number of positive cases among SARC countries, taking, a to taking the total to 30, followed by Maldives with eight, Afghanistan with seven, Bangladesh with three, Sri Lanka with two, and Nepal and Bhutan with one case each. New Delhi has suspended bus and train services to Bangladesh. The confirmed cases in India include 17 foreigners. Contact tracing of the 84 positive cases has led to identification of more than 4,000 who are under surveillance, the health ministry said. New clusters of the novel coronavirus are expanding in the United States and Europe as Italy replaces China as the current epicenter of a worldwide outbreak. For most people, the virus causes only mild or moderate symptoms such as fever and cough. For some, especially older adults and people with existing health problems, it can cause, cause more severe illness, including pneumonia. The World Health Organization declared the outbreak a pandemic but said it's not too late for countries to act. By using the word it had previously shied away from, the UN Health Agency appeared to want to shock lethargic countries into action, into pulling out of pulling out all the stops as cases mount globally. We have called every day for countries to take urgent and aggressive action. We have rung the alarm bell loud and clear, said WHO chief Tedros Adnom Ghebreyesus. A study by the US scientists found the new coronavirus could be detected in the air up to three hours after being sprayed. It could live up to 24 hours on cardboard and up to three days on plastic and stainless steel. To determine their findings published on Wednesday, researchers used a nebulizer device to put samples of the new virus into the air, simulating what might happen if an infected person coughed or made the virus airborne some other way. 
Beijing city government ordered all passengers arriving in the city from overseas, regardless of their points of departure, to undergo a 14-day quarantine. The move was part of stepped-up measures to prevent the new virus first detected in China from re-entering the country following its spread across the world. The outbreak in China has been easing, with just 24 new cases confirmed, reported on Wednesday. Five of those arrived from Italy and one from the United States. As schools around the world close or, or move classes online, experts are debating whether such measures help protect students or the surrounding communities. The downsides include the hypothetical risk of children infecting grandparents or other caretakers and the potential harm to children's education and nutritional needs. Still, Poland and Ukraine have joined the countries deciding to close schools. The two Eastern European nations have small numbers of confirmed cases. More U.S. colleges and universities are also extending spring breaks and moving classes online as cases in the country pushed past 1,000. Millions of Americans braced for the week ahead with no school for their children for many days to come. No clue how to effectively do their jobs without childcare and a growing sense of dread about how to stay safe and sane amid the relentless spread of the coronavirus. Tens of millions of students nationwide have been sent home from school amid a wave of closings that include all of Ohio, Maryland, Oregon, Washington State, Florida and Illinois, along with big city districts like Los Angeles, San Francisco and Washington, D.C. Some schools announced they will close for three weeks, others for up to six. The disruptions came as government and hospital leaders took new measures to contain an outbreak that has sickened more than 150,000 people worldwide and killed about 5,800, with thousands of new cases being confirmed every single day. As the U.S. death toll climbed to 51 on Saturday and infections to totaled more than 2,100, President Donald Trump expanded a ban on travel to the U.S. from Europe, adding Britain and Ireland to the list. And hospitals worked to expand bed capacity and staffing to keep from becoming overwhelmed as the caseloads, caseload mounts. We have not reached our peak, Dr. Anthony Fossey of the National Institute of Health said. We will see more cases and we will see more suffering and death. The cascade of closings appended weekend routines for countless mothers and fathers. Little League and other sports were cancelled. Parks were closed, play dates were appended. The size of the crowd at a public library in, in suburban Portland rivaled that of the neighborhood Costco as parents scrambled to stockpile books for children. While some people were opting to isolate themselves, not everyone was ready to put their lives on hold. Despite the cancellation of St. Patrick's Day parades around the country and pleas to curtail public gatherings, pub celebrations continued in many places. In Chicago, pub crawls and other revelry went ahead as planned, prompting an angry rebuke from Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker. If you are young and healthy, listen up. We need you to follow social, social distancing too, Pritzker said, urging partygoers to go home. Spring break partying in Florida also prompted official action, with authorities closing South Beach to prevent the virus spread. Miami Beach officials ordered hundreds of college spring breakers and others from around the world off the beach on Saturday and eliminated parking on major streets in the city's entertainment district to cut down on crowds at South Beach clubs and restaurants. Many working parents are scrambling to find child care, even if they are being allowed to work from home. The child care needs are especially dire for the legions of nurses, hospital and healthcare workers across the country who need to be on the job to deal with the crisis. Governors drew up emergency plans to find childcare for frontline medical workers and first responders, equating it to a wartime effort. Russian lawmakers on Wednesday rapidly rubber-stamped sweeping constitutional changes that could keep President Vladimir Putin in power until 2036. If Putin won and completed two more terms as president, it would make him the ruler of Russia for 36 years, longer than any other leader in his modern history. The measure must still be approved by the country's constitutional court and by a nationwide vote next month before they come into force. Putin's critics called for protests condemning the move as a way to keep him in office after he hits his term limit in 2024. 
The Kremlin controlled lower house, the State Duma, endorsed a set of amend amendments to the Russian constitution and a provision that resets the term count for Putin once the revisions come into force. It passed the chamber by a 383 to 0 vote with 43 abs um, absentees and several hours later sailed through the upper house. The Federal Council by a vote of 160 to 1 and with three abs absentees. It is unclear when the Constitutional Court will rule, but a nationwide vote on the proposed amendments is set for April 22nd. The 67-year-old former KGB officer has ruled Russia for more than 20 years, becoming the country's longest-serving ruler since Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, who was in power for 29 years. After serving two consecutive four-year terms, a limit outlined in the current constitution, Putin shifted to the prime minister's seat in 2008, with close ally Dmitry Medvedev becoming a placeholder president. The length of the presidency was extended to six years under Medvedev, and in 2012, Putin returned to the Kremlin as president. In 2018, he was re-elected for another six years. Putin has weathered multiple international storms during his tenure. The 2014 annexation of Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula boosted his approval ratings that have remained high despite Russia's economic troubles amid a showdown with the West. Putin has used those tensions to consolidate support at home and strengthen his image as a strong leader standing up to foreign pressure. The constitutional amendment was proposed Tuesday by lawmaker Valentina Tereshkova, a former Soviet cosmonaut who was the first woman in space in 1963. The measures restarts Putin's, Putin's term to zero once it is up in 2024. It would allow him to run for president twice more than after that if he chooses. The review of the provision by the constitutional court is widely seen as a formality. Staff at a Sydney nursing home refused to turn up to work this week after a coronavirus outbreak at the facility. According to their union, the workers were worried about con contracting the virus themselves and passing it on to their own families. It's an entirely understandable concern. The New South Wales government scrambled to find alternative staff to keep the home open and care for the elderly residents. The incident was a worrying example of what could lie ahead if the virus continues to spread. What if staff refuse to turn up at more nursing homes or hospitals? What if coronavirus causes popped up at, pop up at power stations or water treatment plants and workers walked off the job? Who would keep the lights on and the water flowing? While much of the focus has understandably been on the government's response to the health and economic challenges posed by this virus, work has also been underway on protecting critical infrastructure and social order in the event panic really sets in. This goes well beyond dealing with nervous shoppers clearing the shelves of toilet paper and hand sanitizer. On Tuesday, Attorney General Christian Porter gave a few hints of the planning underway when he hit the airwaves to remind us of the, pow of the powers of the Commonwealth has, uh, I beg your pardon, to remind us of powers the Commonwealth has at its disposal under the Biosecurity Act passed in 2015. Porter warned people could encounter practices and instructions and circumstances that they have, not be, they have not had to encounter before. A quick perusal of the Act reveals wide-ranging powers to forcibly detain individuals for quarantine and enforce decontamination procedures where necessary. On Thursday, the Prime Minister revealed the National Security Committee of Cabinet had also taken a formal decision to trigger what's called the National Coordination Mechanism. This, he said, dealt with border with broader non-health issues when it comes to power, continuity of services, supporting workforce needs and how those issues can be managed on the ground and working with state and territory police forces. There were few details, but it's understood this declaration would enable the government to use sweeping powers to coordinate with state and local jurisdictions to keep the lights on and clean water flowing. This may involve, involve standing up decontamination units to ensure some level of safety or finding substitute staff to keep facilities operating. Hopefully, it won't come to that. The Prime Minister maintains it's still best for everyone to keep calm and carry on, but behind the scenes, prudent planning is underway for a more serious outbreak. The Chief Medical Officer this week revealed the worst-case scenario plan involves millions of Australians becoming infected. 
On Friday, the Prime Minister suggested the cost of treating the coronavirus in the nation's hospital could run up to $1 billion. As he agreed, the Commonwealth would foot 50% of the bill. Reserve Bank interest rate cuts will do little to keep Australia out of a deep recession if coronavirus becomes a severe pandemic. But there are some unconventional policies that could help save the economy. As for the economic cost, it is impossible to know how bad things could get. The Prime Minister is giving no guarantees, but he simply can't afford a recession on his watch. For the past decade, the coalition has backed Labour Labor for spending too much on stimulus in response to the global financial crisis, but Labour did manage to keep Australia out of recession. If the economy slips into recession now because the Morrison government isn't willing to spend enough in the right areas, the coalition's economic credibility will be badly damaged. Perhaps irre irre irrevocably so. I got that out finally. That's why the Prime Minister is taking this, this his time with the stimulus package and talking about a scale, scalable response. If the first round of fiscal firepower isn't enough, more will follow. The prudent planning needs to involve not just critical infrastructure, but protecting the jobs and livelihoods of millions of Australians. Japan is adamant the Olympics will go ahead, even as other global sporting events have been put on hold. Speculation about a delay from the July start date has grown since US President Donald Trump said organizers should consider a one-year postponement. Japan is still preparing to host the Olympics, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said on Saturday, despite rising global concerns about the viability of the summer games due to the coronavirus outbreak. Abe and his government have been adamant the Olympics will go ahead even as other global sporting events have been put on hold. Speculation about a delay from the July start date has grown since US President Donald Trump said organizers should consider a one-year postponement. Abe and Trump held a call after those comments prompting the US President to say on Twitter that the Olympic venue was magnificent but this may not be enough to assuage sponsors of the Games who are increasingly nervous about how the impact of the outbreak is going to be on the competition. The Olympic torch relay in which the Olympic flame typically starts a tour around the host nation is due to start in the Japanese prefecture of Fukushima in less than two weeks. The tour of the torch through Greece has already been cut short. We will overcome the spread of the infection and host the Olympics without a problem as planned. Abe told a news conference in Tokyo adding that delaying or cancelling the Olympics was not a subject at all in his call with Trump. He said Japan worked closely with the International Olympic Committee, which will have the final decision whether the Games to go ahead or not. And the UN World Health Organization suggesting he accepted that Tokyo would not ultimately decide on the event. He said Japan had a relatively low infection rate and had not seen an explosion in cases as seen in South Korea, China, Italy, Iran and elsewhere. He said, he said delaying the peak of infections was vital to ensure treatment of those in critical condition. Abe said Japan did not need to declare a national emergency, although Parliament on Friday approved a bill to give him emergency powers and allow him to close schools, halt large gatherings and requisition medical supplies. Tokyo Governor Yuriko Kojike Koike promised through measures against the coronavirus outbreak and said preparations for a safe and secure games were progressing, TV Asahi reported. Greece's Olympic Committee cancelled on Friday the remainder of the Olympic torch relay through Greece to avoid attracting crowds, while the relay through Japan is scheduled to start on March 26th. Japan had 21 new coronavirus cases, cases as of Saturday evening, bringing the total to 1,443 public broadcaster NHK reported, while the, the, the virus has killed 28 people in Japan. The total infections included 697 from the Diamond Princess cruise ship and 14 returnees on chartered flights from China, according to the NHK. Japan's fatalities included those from the ship. Well, that's what we have for you this week. More next week. Namaskar.